Good morning, everybody. What if it rained? Wouldn't that be nice? Um, you know, I look at the news and there is so many places in southeast Queensland that are flooded out. For those that have been asking about my family in Gympie, they're all well. Uh, they're out of flood levels. The flood that's in Gympie is probably one of the biggest in a long time, but they are well. If they're underwater, the entirety of Gympie is underwater. So um, they're well and truly safe. Mum and Dad are without power and phone, I think, at the moment, or landline at least. Um, but I've been talking to them this morning. They're all well and good. Gympie's not having a church service today because they have no power. Um, along with other Ipswich and all the other southeast Queensland area that's um, inundated with water. We need to be upholding them, as we do uh, the rest of our world. Many of you are very conscious of what's happening over uh, with the Ukrainians and uh, Russia and the, the rest of the world as we watch on for that. And what if comes to mind as I think about what if we let God be God? And what if we turned back to him? everything could change in an instant. But we, we really can't tell God what to do in any true sense of the word. We, we can certainly ask, and we can certainly um, ask for things that we think need to happen, and there are, it's very clear that God even listens to those things as you read through the scriptures where God has seemingly changed his mind on some of those things that man has prayed for. And we're in a series called What If? And we've been looking or considering some questions or some statements that I think at times have been sometimes a little personal for me and hopefully for you, but sometimes even a little controversial. Last week, um, we, we, oh, sorry, last week we talked about what if we listened more intently um, or what, what if we listened more? I think Pastor Jasmine uh, made that comment. The week before that, we talked about what if... Sorry, my iPad has just crashed and now I have nothing here. Um, what if... Um, the sec first week we started off, what if there is more to life? And we talked about in the second week, what if, what if relationship was what we were really created for? And um, then last week was, what if we listened more? Today, um, when I find my message for you, what do we, the what if we made prayer a priority? And I think that's exactly where we're at today. What if we prayed for our world? What if we made prayer the priority? And as we do that, I think God would, it's not that God won't listen anyway, but I believe that things would be, vastly different and I've been the pastor at this church for just on 14 years now and I remember when we first came and the excitement of being um, in the ministry here in Yapoon and this church over those past 14 years has, has literally become my family my family blood family have been back in Gympie and I have um, everything else that's um, been tied to that was left 14 years ago when we came up here. And I feel that I can be pretty honest with you guys and I want to be very honest and it's been always my goal to be transparent. And so I want to make a confession to you this morning. And that is, I don't struggle with prayer. I struggle with my priorities. I mean, I know the value of prayer. I've preached about it. I've talked about it. I even come to prayer meetings. I've been at prayer and fasting weekends and times that we've had for the church. So I understand the value of prayer, but I do struggle with making prayer a priority. And then I got to thinking, if that's the case, if I'm... If I'm not coming before the Lord as a priority in my life and seeking his guidance and, and this enablement and all that I do, then clearly it follows that it would seem like to everybody else that, I, that we don't need to come before God if, if I don't come before him. 
If I don't see that as a priority in my life, how could I expect others to see it as a priority in their own life? My priority at some point has to be wrong, if that's the case. My thinking even went a little bit further than that, though, because if prayer wasn't my priority, then perhaps I wasn't even being honest with myself. If prayer wasn't really what I was talking about, was I really depending upon God for things? Or was my lack of devotion to prayer an indication of a pride issue? And that got me thinking even a little deeper. And if that was the case, then perhaps me in my neglecting of prayer or making prayer a priority is actually affecting my spiritual walk. And making that confession is a little embarrassing to you, to, for me, to, as I confess it to you. After all, I'm the pastor, and in fact, as a Christian, prayer should be one of the priorities that we have, right? And it, and it should be something that we all pursue after. It should be the backbone of everything. So it's in that context that I want to share with you today and I'm conscious that there is a constant battle between doing the right things and, do, and prioritizing the right things. And the reality is, and I think this is key to my thinking at least, and I think it's true for all of us, the reality is that we always choose according to our strongest inclination at the moment of choice. That's what we do. It's true for every single choice we make, whether we pray or whether we hand over our wallets to a thief. We, the decision that we make is always what we see as the, at the moment that we prefer over any other choice that we make. So, what if we made prayer a priority? What if prayer moved from being this extracurricular activity that we added on when we had time to being the most important and desirable thing that we ever do? What if we shifted our thinking in that area and it became the most important thing in our life? Because the truth is that if prayer isn't our primary priority, the highest thing that we can do Physically, I guess. We won't pray more because we won't need to. We won't pray more because we believe that whatever we're doing at that time is much more important or more desirable. Um, but what if we made no more excuses? What if we recognised our problem of priority? I think we'd be dangerous. As Christians, I really honestly do believe that. And so today I want to, I want to take a look at, a, a, do a little bit of a study on a man that many of you will know from the Old Testament. And as soon as I mention the book, you will know uh, who I'm speaking about. But I feel this, this man is a man who epitomizes the priority of prayer. A man who, despite the pressure to do other things that he was told that he should be doing, he remained faithful to his commitment to pray. A man who prioritised prayer so much that it actually put him on death row. The man that I'm speaking about is Daniel. And I want to read you that account in Daniel chapter 6 of what took place and how Daniel prioritised his prayer time. So if you've got your scriptures, you can follow along with me. If it, It'll be on the screen, but I, I want to pick it up in verse 1. And it says this, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each promise, a province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators, to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers 
And because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. <clears throat> then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling governmental, government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticise or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded our only... <clears throat> Excuse me. Our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. <clears throat> so the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors and governors that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced, give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so that it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So the king, so king Darius signed the law. <clears throat> But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem and he prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him about this law. Did you not sign a law for the next 30 days? Any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion's den or the den of lions? Yes, the king replied, that decision stands. It's an official law of the Medes and Persians. It cannot be revoked. Then they told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, he is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of the predicament. In the evening, the men went back together to, went together to the king and said, Your Majesty, you know that according to the law to the Medes and the Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. The king said to him, May your God whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed the throne with the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. And then the king returned to his palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep all that night. Very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. And when he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den and not a scratch was found on him for he had trusted in his God. May God then bless us as we finish the reading there this morning. The first thing I want us to understand or to recognise in regards to Daniel's prayer is that this wasn't just some rebellious performance that Daniel was performing at that point in time. He wasn't demonstrating his objection to everything by doing what he did as he opened up the window toward Jerusalem and he prayed and gave thanks the scripture says the the account that we've just read tells us that it's just what he did as was his custom what he always did he didn't stop doing what he was always doing just because there were some other consequences around I don't know about you but when I read that when I read how Daniel prayed openly and he did what he always did because it was the right thing to do, it, in what kind of seems like indirect defiance to the king's, king's edict, 
I question what my own response would have been. How would I have responded to that? I know what I would probably do, and I'm embarrassed. Because this is how I think I would have expected Daniel to, to live. What I would completely understand if the Bible had said that Daniel got on his knees and he freaked out. Crying out to God for deliverance. It would have made complete sense to us to read that scripture and, and to, to, for Daniel not to open up the window toward Jerusalem, but to keep the window closed for crying out loud. Surely he can pray to God through a closed window as easily as he can through an open window and God would still hear that. Surely he could pray secretly and not be found out. Because after all, can't God still hear us? That's how I'd have thought. But what it says is that Daniel gave thanks to God with the windows wide open, even before God had delivered him, even before one prayer of Daniel's, I am confident, had been answered. Which leads me to the first point. If you've got sermon notes in front of you, the, the lined word or the missing word is faith. What if we prayed with faith? Because that's what Daniel was doing when he was praying and expressing thankfulness even before his prayers had been answered. Daniel was very aware that what he was doing was absolutely wrong because the scriptures that we read it, when Daniel became aware of what was going to happen, he opened up his window, he went upstairs, opened up his windows and he knelt down and he prayed as he usually did. Daniel was completely aware of the consequences that were about to take place. He knew that there would be perhaps not many more opportunities to pray like this anymore because, after all, he was going to get thrown into the lion's den if he was found out and he wasn't hiding the fact that he was praying. But he also knew that God was bigger than any problems that might arise. He knew that God was able to do exceedingly abundantly more than ever he could ask for or even imagine would take place at that particular point in time. He knew that God was able to protect him. And he knew that in the words of his friends, that even if he didn't protect him now, that there was no way that he was going to defile himself and bow before the king. So why not close the window? Why not just close the window? Because that was the moment, that was the very moment when he made that choice that Daniel put his faith into action. That I know my God can provide for me. And by opening the window, he was openly and publicly declaring that God alone was worthy of worship. That he was openly declaring that he alone was the one he was going to pray to. Even if he was a little nervous. And I'm sure there was some nervousness in there somewhere from Daniel. Even if he was a little nervous about what the outcome was going to be. He was, now, he was so unwilling to hide his faith in his God. He, would be, he was unwilling to now pray in secret when everyone knew that this was Daniel's habit. Everyone knew this was what Daniel did every single day. What would it say to everyone if Daniel's faith was such that the window was closed? Oh, he's scared. Where's his faith now? What are the rest of the world going to think if Daniel kept his window closed, even if he was praying? What would they say about his faith? How would that be portrayed if Daniel was too scared to go against the king? It would indicate a very big lack of faith in God Almighty. So that got me thinking, what if we prayed in that same vein? What if we are in the habit of praying and giving thanks in advance 
for the things that God, are, while yet unseen, God has already answered? What if we were to thank him for the outcome of what's going on in our world and our culture right at this moment in time? What if we were consistent in our prayer, understanding that God is in control, no matter what it looks like on the surface, that he's bigger than the problems, that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly more than what we could ever ask for or imagine? What if we prayed earnestly and publicly and actually believed what we were doing, what we were praying for was actually already answered in the right way? I believe we would get to see answers for our prayers. If we would pray more consistently and more with faith, I I believe that our answers would be answered quickly. Because we would be in alignment with what God wants us to be asking for. I believe that the prayer offered in faith from a righteous heart, from a righteous person is so powerful and effective. It's what James tells us, exactly that. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power. And it produces wonderful results. James even reminds us that that Elijah, even though he was an ordinary human man, he prayed that rain wouldn't happen. And what happened? Rain stopped for three and a half years until he prayed again. And I believe we would begin to see miracles of healing and restoration that would take place in our community and our culture more readily than they do at present. And again, James tells us that even when we're sick in James 5, he says, call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you if you're sick, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you'll also be forgiven. I'm not denying the power of doctors and nurses and and all the medical staff. We need them. They're gifted and they should be there. But I am saying that prayer needs to be a priority. In the process and there are many Christian medical personnel who would stand by that I believe that if we were to pray believing placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ praying according to his will knowing that we are his ambassadors to do the things here on earth that he has called us to do that when we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we will be praying with his authority and his power and the prayer that's offered in faith, it will be answered. And when we pray those kinds of prayers, we will begin to see people healed. We will begin to see people's lives restored. We will see our society changed from the root up. We will see our, our community changed for the better. We would see sinful behavior forgiven Grace embraced, mercy given. We would see the power of God at work in our community, in our time. And as I said before, I think we'd be dangerous. What if we prayed with boldness? That's the second word that you can fill in if you're filling in notes. What if we prayed with boldness? What would happen if we we just threw open our window and we publicly and unashamedly prayed for our community? Because that's exactly what Daniel did. He knew the consequences as he opened up those windows. He knew what was likely to happen, but he also knew what the right thing to do. He was bold. Was he concerned about what might happen? Perhaps, he may well have been, we're not told anything, but I'm pretty sure as a human being, there would have been some concerns in what he was doing. But it didn't stop him from doing what was right. Because he believed that his God was able to be anything or to protect him, even in the midst of that. And even if he didn't, it wasn't the right thing to do. Was was not to worship, sorry, the right thing to do was not worshipping the king. It didn't stop him doing what he always did because it was the right thing to do. And what did he pray? 
Well, how did he pray? The scriptures tell us that he gave thanks. Thanks, Lord. Thanks for this predicament you've put me into. Thank you for the opportunity to display your faithfulness. Thank you for the way in which you are blessing me. As he opened up the windows, thank you for the community of people that you've put me in so that your power might be displayed and, and my weakness might be made evident. Thank you for displaying your power before your people. The reality is that that type of praying can only come from a relationship that we were talking about a few weeks ago, where there is a connection between the head and the body. It can only happen like that because if the body does not know what the head wants, how can we pray with such authority? How can we pray and know that God will hear our prayers if the body has, and the relationship is not what it should be? Being able to pray with confidence and boldness like Daniel prayed, then we can only come when we have this intimate relationship with God the Father, when our, when our relationship is such that we, we know what he wants. His thoughts are our thoughts, not the other way around. It comes through knowing him and knowing his character. It's more about knowing God rather than knowing about God. And there's a vast difference between those two phrases. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he said to the Jewish leaders in John 5, he says, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. And whatever the Father does, the Son is also doing. Think about that. Jesus could only do what he saw the Father doing. The reason that his prayers were answered isn't because he was Jesus necessarily. It's because he was in a relationship with God the Father. He did what his Father told him to do and his Father blessed that. The relationship was so intimate that Jesus didn't do anything other than what the Father wanted him to do. Imagine what might happen in our prayer life if that's the way that we lived. Imagine if we weren't distracted and delayed in our thinking and what was supposed to go on and we, we got you know, waylaid along the path in our prayer times or even to start a prayer time. Imagine... If our relationship with the Father was the way that it was supposed to be, we'd be able to pray with such boldness, knowing that whatever we asked for, whatever we asked in the name of Jesus, not only would it be heard, but we would have that. Because we'd be praying in alignment from the Father. We would be doing what the Father asks of us and know that it's already blessed. We wouldn't have to ask those permissions. That's exactly what Jesus said in John 14. He says, you can ask for anything in my name and I'll do it. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. The, the, if the context of that is not just, you know, if it's for selfish reason, forget it. But anything you ask in the name of Jesus, what Jesus would want, what the Father wants, if you ask according to my will, you have it. The conditions of that promise is that we do that. We ask according to his will. James again tells us in James 4. He says, even when you ask, you don't get what you want because your motives are all wrong. You only want what you have for your own pleasure. Don't expect to get anything when that's the reason or that's the motive that we're asking for. Don't expect anything. What if we prayed with consistent regularity is the word for the number three, regularity. What if we prayed with consistent regularity? And when we read the the account of David, what we find is that his enemies could find absolutely nothing to criticise or condemn him with. They were in trouble. Daniel was about to become the one that was over all of them. He was an import. He wasn't even a local. And they didn't like that. 
How are we going to stop this Daniel? And they tried and tried. They couldn't find anything. The only conclusion that they could come with, that he was, he was faithful in his, real, in his walk with the Lord, but faithful in his doing, dealings with the king. He was always responsible and completely trustworthy. How are we going to deal with this guy? Wish our government was like that. I wish our leadership of our communities and our states and our country were like that. So the question for them was, how can we bring Daniel down? And they realised the only way of doing that was to find grounds and accusing him in his connection with his religion, with his God that he prayed to three times a day. They knew that he did that because it was public knowledge and a public declaration. That's how they knew where to attack because Daniel kept religiously his three prayers a day. And they knew that they could rely on him to be at his window, praying over Jerusalem. And I'm confident that their desire was to criticize him for, if, if here's the dilemma that Daniel was in, if he didn't do that, they'd criticize him for what he didn't do. If he did do that, they would bring that before the king, which is essentially what happened. He was in a no-win position. He was going to be in trouble whichever way he went. And my mind goes back to Peter and what he says into the Roman leadership and the Pharisees when they said, don't you dare preach in the name of the Lord anymore. And he says, well, what am I going to do? Do I obey man or do I obey God? And I think that's where Daniel came to. Do I obey the law of man or am I going to obey God? So let me ask you a question. What is your greatest obstruction to prayer? What hinders you? I know that most of us would probably say that we should pray more, that we should pray better. We could all pray longer. We could probably all pray with more fervency. So what is it that prevents that from happening? I'll tell you. Your enemy provides you with an alternative. That's what happens. You have a choice to make. The enemy comes and he provides you with an alternative. Daniel's enemies provided him with an alternative to worship and prayer. Satan does the same for us, whether it's work, sport, tiredness, laziness, busyness, family. There's a whole heap of things that he does. He creates an alternative option. And he offers them as an alternative to being consistent and regular in our attendance to prayer. It's offered because he knows that there is power in prayer. And if he can stop us having that connection of power and life, he takes away power from us. That's why we battle so much with prayer. That's why almost every one of us struggles in this area of prayer. It's, it's an underhanded attempt by Satan to cause us, to accuse us of not being faithful and diligent in the walk that we profess so loudly. If you really were sons of God, what you don't even pray enough. You don't talk to him enough. You've always got excuses for not praying. That's the, that's the criticism that Satan brings into ourselves. That's how we see ourselves. He takes away the communication that we absolutely need with our Heavenly Father as the body of Christ. He takes away that communication and he prevents us from knowing what we are to do, how we should act. And because we don't know what we are to do, we'll be like lost sheep wandering around helplessly. It's exactly how Jesus saw the crowds when he walked on this planet in Matthew 5 he's, in Matthew 9 he says when he saw the crowds what did he do he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd but Jesus 
was never confused or helpless in his mission. Not just because he was Jesus, but because I believe he prioritized prayer. He placed prayer as the most important thing in his life. He was constantly praying to his heavenly father. The Bible reveals that, God, that Jesus got up early in the morning before the sunrise. Where was he? Out praying. He went off during the day. The disciples lost him at times. Where is he? Out praying. At night time, there are times when it says that he prayed all night. There was never one specific time. It was a constant thing for Jesus because he did not do whatever the Father did not want him to do. He was in constant communication with the Father. Even every little decision, choosing the 12 disciples. What did it tell us in the scriptures? That whole night he prayed, asking for guidance. And the next morning he chose his 12 He asked everything of the Father. When Jesus fed the 5,000 with loaves of of bread and, and fish, he prayed. He looked towards heaven and thanked God and blessed it. We also read that he that people brought children to him so that he prayed over them and blessed them. In the Garden of Gethsemane, on the night of his betrayal, John 17, he, he, he contemplated the horrors that were about to take place over the next 24 hours or so. And what did it say? He prayed. John 17, the whole of that chapter is, is Jesus' prayer. Not just for his disciples, not even, it, it was for himself, his disciples, but it was also for you and I. For those that are still to come, may they be unified. May they be one as you and I, Father, as one. May they be sanctified with the truth. That's his prayer that he prayed for you and I. May we be like him. On the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And he also cried, my God, my God, why why have you forsaken me? He's still talking to his heavenly father. He blessed food. He blessed children. He prayed for you and I. Prayer was a normal and natural component of Jesus' day. Whether good things were happening or not. So, what would happen if we made prayer a priority this year? What would it look like to be praying with faith What things might we pray in faith for? What would we add to our prayer lists? What would it look like if we began to pray boldly, with conviction, believing that our prayers are not just heard, but they're actually answered because of the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father? What if our prayers... To, or our answers to prayer were not exactly what we even prayed for. How would we respond to that? We prayed one thing, but God answered in a different way. How would we go with that? What if we decided not to allow anything or anyone to hinder that which we normally do? What if we were ready to open up the windows of our upper room and we were to pray over our community? What if we were to walk down the street or to stand in the park or to stand on the hill and publicly declare our allegiance to our Heavenly Father? What if we did that? What if we were not so concerned about the worldly consequences that will probably happen as a result of that stance and we were more concerned with the consequences of not trusting God? What if? What if the church, all of us, we began to live a little dangerously? That we came out from hiding behind the brush and allowed God to ignite a flame in us? What if? What if we began a revolution and we didn't back down from persecution, but we became part of the solution? And we got in the business of the distribution of love and grace and hope. What if? What if we knew what God had said and let his word wrap around our heart and our head 
more than words on a page. Collecting dust, unread, but a book that's alive in us, not dead. What if? What if our families were thriving, a place of peace, no depriving or striving, more than just surviving, but rising up to give and to serve and to care and to guide. And we set aside our pride and we decided to abide and we stay beside a place where children could confide and love was supplied. What if, what if you're 12 or 16 or 20 and you begin to live with courage, unlike so many, possess valour and boldness and faith aplenty. Let God write your story from the very beginning. Hand him your record and let him start it spinning. All the some days I'll be, they're phony and they're fleeting. You're worthy now. And your life has meaning. What if? What if when we heard, we actually listened? And we took it to heart, not just superficially, but we went back to the start and made the effort to do our part. Together with the body of Christ in unity, not apart, but where we encourage one another and knowledge impart. What if? What if when we spoke, we spoke with conviction of Jesus, his life, his death and resurrection and crucifixion? How Jesus can help us through affliction and addiction. What if we weren't worried about causing friction with our neighbour or explaining contradictions, but just sought to love? What if? What if we unleashed compassion and we flung our faith into action and we opened our hands, our homes, our wallets, our door to the lonely and the outcast, the hurting and the poor and we gave to our neighbours and we didn't keep score. We humbled ourselves so others could soar. What if? What if? Our what ifs are more than just words we say. More than a game we play. What if we didn't stray or sway or live our lives in shades of grey? What if instead this day we pray? God, make this our DNA. I think we'd be dangerous. God bless you.